Hello, hello. Yes, here we go. So we are about to begin. Everybody, please um, come in, take seats if you're going to. So I, uh, I want to uh, welcome you this evening. My name is Michael Sipser. I'm the Dean uh, of Science here at MIT. And um, we are this evening going to have a panel discussion about the recent detection of gravitational waves. Uh, These were, predicted to, these were predicted to exist 100 years ago by Albert Einstein. So this is a his, oh, oh, first I want to, I'm told I need to thank the LSE um, uh, for jointly hosting this event with us. Um, I think they own this room on Friday night, so we're very grateful to them for uh, letting us use it. Um, and so I want to say this is a historic moment for science. I'm very proud. Uh, that MIT has played a major role in it uh, through the LIGO project. And I just want to say that I feel incredibly lucky to be Dean of Science at this time with a front row seat on this incredible, glorious achievement. Um, in fact, I got a little bit of a preview of um, the, uh, the news of the, of the detection uh, a, little, a little bit before the actual news release, because it was embargoed. As you know, the detection occurred in September and was only uh, released until, uh, only released, um, uh, had the news released uh, recently. So now, before I take my front row seat uh, here in the, in the front, uh, I want to introduce Jackie Hewitt, who is uh, here with us. Who's, uh, Jackie is a professor of physics and the director of our Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and she will introduce the panelists for us. Well, I just, I just want to say I'm up here sharing the stage for a few minutes with five remarkable people who have done such a wonderful discovery. I'm only allowed a few minutes, and so I thought I would use that time to talk a little bit about the people who've been involved in this. If you look at the paper that was published, last week. It's published by the LIGO Scientific Collaboration with something like a thousand authors. And this just tells you what a complicated, difficult business this is. You need people who understand general relativity. You can people who can solve the equations and it mostly has to be done numerically to write the software, to pull out the signal and write the papers, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to say within that LIGO scientific collaboration, there's a very important core to the experiment, and that's the LIGO laboratory. And these, those are the people who are here today, at least the MIT part. The five people here are from the MIT LIGO laboratory, and there are a bunch of people here that I recognize in the audience. There are about 30 people working in the MIT LIGO laboratory here. And this is a collaboration with Caltech. And over the last several decades, this has been the people who, first with Ray coming up with the idea in 1960-something, and who built prototypes and raised money and tested and built another prototype and raised more money until finally they wrote this successful proposal to the NSF to build those detectors that you see up there on the screen. And it's really been a remarkable journey. So we've got five here, and I get to introduce them. And let me start with Salvo Vitale, who joined MIT in 2012. He came as a postdoc. He came to us from Paris, from the Pierre et Marie uh, Pécurie University. And he's concerned on the data analysis end of things more, extracting the signal from the data. And then we have Lisa Barsot. MIT in 2007 as a post, no, yes, as a postdoc. And she's now a principal research scientist. She got her PhD in Italy working on, the, on a European sort of version of LIGO, a gravitational wave detector called Virgo, which will soon also be operating with LIGO. And then next to her, we have Matt Evans, who also came to MIT in 2007. He actually got his PhD at Caltech working on LIGO, and then went to Italy for a few years to work on the Virgo detector, and then came to MIT to continue the LIGO work. He is now on the faculty, the physics faculty. Uh, farther down the line, we have Ed Birchinger, who came to MIT about the time I did, longer than I care to remember at this point. And um, he's a theorist who works on cosmology, gravitation, general relativity, that sort of thing. So he's helping us understand these signals that are coming out of this instrument. 
And last but not least, the gentleman at the end of the row who uh, has been is almost a lifer, not quite. He got his bachelor's degree at MIT, his PhD at MIT. Then he managed to escape to Tufts and Princeton for a few years. And then he came back on the faculty in 1964. And as I understand it, when he was teaching general relativity here in 1967, he had the idea for this laser detector that might uh, detect gravitational waves someday. So it's just thrilling that it happened. And Ray's the hardest working retired person I know. He is. <laughs> He's still working on the detectors, fixing the vacuum system. Is that the thing? Yeah. OK. <laughs> so I will now. Ray is going to be moderating the discussion this evening. So I now turn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for introducing everybody. I was going to do that, too, so you, I, don't, I now have a little more time. Uh, the guy's going to keep me honest so that it doesn't take longer than nine minutes is, is Ed. So you, you have a little thing to keep me from overdoing my, my little thing. And what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about what happened at MIT before the big whoop de doo In other words, uh, before this thing really turned into a monster project. And uh, mostly, I want, to, but I want to show you some slides, but what I'm trying to get at if in case I lose you, is the fact that this was strongly influenced. The whole project was strongly affected and influenced by education here. The undergrad, you'll see this in a minute. Education was very central to this, and I'll show you in a minute why. So the first slide I'm going to show you is where it took place. So let me do that by doing this, is Building 20, which is sitting it's sort of in a cemetery. Uh, that, but it's where. <laughs> <laughs> the building. Okay, and we were, this is this building in about 1986, so you can see it's kind of shabby, it's full of asbestos, and down in this corner right there is where the lab was, right there at the intersection of Main Street and Vassar Street, and that's all the things you're going to see. That is the beginning of LIGO, and the beginning of all the work done here, that was where the lab was, and what was so marvelous about Building 20? was that you could do anything you damn pleased in that building. <laughs> you, you, you could tear the walls down, and we did that. You could, you could move the wiring without them bothering you in physical plant. You, you had room to have desks for every undergraduate. That's one of the reasons why so many undergraduates were mixed up with it. There was nobody caring about that they're jealously guarding that room, the rooms. We had all sorts of stuff. The big problem with the place was the road in front of it, right there. Every truck that went down this took the building and it would shake it like this. <laughs> and that, because the slab was too, too skinny, and that will show up in a minute. So this was a building ideal for doing experiments like the one we're talking about, except for that one problem. And uh, <laughs> it had also one other thing. Since in those days we didn't have lasers you could buy, you could make your own lasers, and you had a, you had a DC power supply sitting someplace. You plug it in, and 100, volt, 100 amperes could come out of the wall. 400 hertz would come out of the wall. It was all part of the Rad Lab, and that was the, the, the legacy we had. OK, so let me go on. So what was in that building was this. And this is the one, one and a half meter prototype. That was the first of these gravitational wave detectors. There is sort of a clean version of it. It never got finished. You can see the laser sitting on the table. But this was the structure. It didn't get finished until much later than this picture. This picture was taken in the late 70s. But here is what happened by the mid-80s. And here are the two graduate students who got their degrees. And David Shoemaker, who was at that time, was also a graduate student, but not working on this in the same way. He was working on Kobe. And he then went to Europe and became the ambassador for this whole field with the Germans. But the interesting thing in this picture was these were the first two graduate students that I had the courage to take to the department as graduate PhDs in this experiment. And I got hell for it. What happened is on the exam of one of the students, they asked, well, what did you measure? And I said, well, well the student bumbled a little bit. And I said, well, he did, you know, we could tell the sun doesn't do anything crazy. And the, 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 I won't tell you who the faculty member was. Well, I can look out the window and see that. <laughs> so you know, it, well, the reception was one of skepticism. This was technology development. You could only do that really in the early days. These were the first two who did it. You could only really do that with undergraduates. And that's why there were so many undergraduates in this thing. OK? Now, that's the story of Building 20. Let me tell you the other critical place for the development of this thing. Uh, how many of you know the F&T? 
That's good. Some people know the F&T. Wonderful. And here is the F&T restaurant. And you can recognize where it is. Here is where the MIT <laughs> publisher of book, book, bookstore is. Here is where the medical <laughs> building is. This is right in the corner. Here's where the MTA station is going to be. And what you're seeing, the scum rumption here, is the MTA tunnel being extended from one part of the Kendall Square to another. But there are the two owners of the, of the restaurant. <laughs> and where all of this got invented, let me say, both the LIGO project, in this case, much of it was invented at a round table right there. <laughs> and at that round table, you had beer, and you had coffee, and you had hot pastrami. It was just wonderful. <laughs> and it was very conducive to making things happen. OK? So there, as a memorial to this, there is a plaque which you can read in Candle Square yourself. I won't read it all to you. You'll have a hard time reading it. But uh, this sits in Kendall Square. You pass it every day if you come by the subway. But the important thing is it says this. I hope I can read it from here. Uh, it was a place where people met. They talked about the, 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 the ballparks. They talked about construction problems. But they also talked about how frogs' eyes see. And they talked about the origins of the universe. And all sorts of projects in MIT were invented in that, uh, that round table because they didn't throw you out. <laughs> OK? So. Now, here is the, we had a memorial for the, our commemoration of the building. And this was in uh, 2000 and, uh, I've forgotten, 2002 or so. One. What, what, one. What, one, one, OK, that's right. And uh, here's uh, the two, two presidents came. That tells you how important that place was. Both Chuck, Chuck Vest and Paul Gray came to this thing because they, they, they recognized the value of such a place. We don't have a place like that anymore. And here is the MIT group when it was still in Building 20. I won't go through all the names, but you'll recognize some younger people than, than, than they are in this room. <laughs> <laughs> and this was in the 1990s. We had built the prototype. Now there was a five meter thing we were trying to build. That was the next thing we were trying to build. And now, this is the group not more than uh, a month and a half ago in building uh, NW17. And I've had to, uh, some were people were missing. Here, here is, here's one of our speakers. And there is another one of our speakers. They were not in the picture. <laughs> OK. I had to put them in. OK. And now I want to show you this. This is, I'll go very quickly through this. This is really, to me, the most important part of the whole thing. This is the number of people over the ep epic from 1968 to 2016. Each one of these slides has various classes of individuals who worked on this thing. Yeah, I'm not asking you to read the names. I just want to give you the feel for the numbers. And uh, this is all the undergraduates who worked on this thing. There are, in that, there are 53 theses, the bachelor's thesis. There are about 150 more undergraduates who did Europe. This is with all of us, by the way. I'm including everything that happened since, you know, not just the, the early part, but also what happened ever since we have more people, on the, uh, more faculty on the thing. So that, we, it was really an undergraduate heaven. We trained an awful number of undergraduates, many who turned into graduate students. And uh, so let me see if I can get this thing to work. Yeah, here is a list of graduate students, and they are about, in that picture, there are about 33 PhDs and about six master's theses, OK? And uh, then there are postdocs and staff and so forth. That I don't want to count those. But, and finally, there's support people. So, it took all of that to get, the, this is the MIT contribution. I haven't even talked about the Caltech and um, uh, the Caltech and the sites yet. That's, this is an MIT fest, so I decided it was mostly for MIT people. So well, thank you. <laughs> I didn't have to say you. you didn't have to use it. Good, and I will use it. Uh, thank you, Ray. I'm, I'm, I'm Ed Birchinger. I'm the one member of the panel who is not part of the uh, LIGO Observatory or the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. Um, but I am a theoretical astrophysicist who um, has taught general relativity and has worked with um, a number of the um, LIGO group here, both in education and um, with some tinkering around the edges of, of research. I, I had a detour a few years ago when I became the physics department head, and that interrupted my pathway into the LIGO scientific collaboration. <laughs> but I want to talk a little bit about uh, what it means to detect gravitational waves. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? 
1883, when Albert Einstein was four years old, an American magazine called the Ch Chautauquan answered that question as follows. No, sound is the sensation excited in the ear when air or other medium is set in motion. Today, we have a much broader concept of sound. Einstein's theory of general relativity is complicated. In 1919, a journalist asked Arthur Eddington, a great British astrophysicist, whether it was true that only three people in the world understood <laughs> general relativity. He replied, who's the third? <laughs> As a graduate student in 1979, taking general relativity for the first time at Princeton University, I wondered the same thing. <laughs> Today, MIT undergraduates take 8962, and we can find the Einstein field equations printed on t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going to share with you. The, the mic is gone. <laughs> you got to put your sweater back on again. Oh, my God. <laughs> OK, we got the joke. <laughs> Here's a quiz for all the 8962 students in the, in the audience. What's my problem? <laughs> this, by the way, is a t-shirt that I purchased from the coop this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and here's my problem. <laughs> if we are r light years from a Kerr-Newman black hole with charge Q and angular momentum S and mass M, and the line element for spacetime in the vicinity of a black hole is ds squared equals blah, 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 and if we know that the constraints, constants of motion are blah, 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 then how long is it before our solar system is sucked into a black hole? <laughs> Tell me, what is wrong with the question? <laughs> the experts are nodding their heads. The solution is wrong. <laughs> the part that I've circled is nonsensical. It's not a black hole. It's something called the metric of flat spacetime, which is exactly the opposite of a black hole. <laughs> the point? Besides the recognition that the coop needs more MIT alumni on its board. <laughs> very good. My conclusion is that people are fascinated by general relativity and black holes. Uh, for a number of years at MIT, I was fortunate enough to have my office next to that of Professor Philip Morrison, oh boy. a famous astrophysicist and educator. Uh, Phil was famously skeptical about the existence of black holes, and he often poked holes in the evidence collected by my colleagues. For about 50 years, astronomers have been talking about black holes as if they actually exist, based on indirect evidence. LIGO's big discovery was a signal emitted from as close to a black hole as we will ever receive of a nature that provides compelling evidence that black holes exist. Phil Morrison would be among the first to congratulate Ray and his colleagues. I hope you're right. <laughs> Why did astronomers think black holes exist? And what did they know about them before the LIGO discovery? Astronomers have long known that massive, compact objects exist in the universe around which orbit debris disks, often from stars that wander too close and get tidally uh, distended. And they studied these debris disks using optical telescopes, radio telescopes, X-ray telescopes, using light or electromagnetic waves. Astronomers have deduced that there are two kinds of black holes distinguished by their mass. Some of them were deduced to have masses less than about 15 times that of our sun. And they were understood to be the remains of massive stars that collapsed upon themselves after they exhausted their nuclear fuel. 
Other black holes had masses of millions or even billions of times that of our sun. They reside in the centers of galaxies and are thought to have been born along with their host galaxies billions of years ago. While the evidence for a lot of mass in a small volume is strong in both cases, astronomers could not see close enough to the black holes to be sure that they weren't something else. They couldn't pass the Phil Morrison test. The black holes are simply too small for our telescopes to make pictures of their surroundings. GW 150914, that's the name of the new black hole, is a case in point. To see light passing close to the black hole would require a telescope capable of, res capable of resolving 10 to the minus 20 radians. Mm -hmm. While the current best technology has a resolution 12 orders of magnitude worse. I know one physicist who's not afraid of 12 <laughs> orders of magnitude and 10 to the minus 20. <laughs> but not that. Ray, a new career? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's bad enough. <laughs> In this case, however, listening is much better than seeing. Recall that sound is the effect recorded by a measurement apparatus when the air or other medium is set in motion. Today, we have a broader concept of sound. Gravitational waves are a kind of sound wave in which space itself is the deformable medium. Nonsense, you say. When a star explodes, there's no sound. <laughs> Hollywood movies notwithstanding. <laughs> it's true that there's no vibration of the air because space is a vacuum. But everyone who has seen the image of a funnel in a science museum or on the cover of a popular book or seen a Stephen Hawking lecture and had the thought warp space time around a black hole, everybody knows that Einstein's theory predicts space deforms in the presence of strong gravitational fields. What we thought was a plane deforms into a funnel. The deformation is characterized by a function called the metric. That's what my t-shirt showed. In fact, Einstein's theory says that what Newtonian physics describes as a gravitational field, taught to thousands of undergraduates in this very room, is really force-free motion in the metric of curved space-time. What exactly does Einstein's theory predict? That's a really good question. Einstein's equations are a system of strongly nonlinear wave equations that are notoriously difficult to solve. In fact, in the 1990s, Kip Thorne of Caltech challenged the community on whether the waveform of a black hole in spiral would be first measured or calculated. Ray, the experimentalists <laughs> came in second. I know they did. <laughs> And I'm glad that they did, because that allowed us to deduce exactly. more from their discovery. Yeah. A few exact solutions of Einstein's equations are known, starting with the Schwarzschild metric discovered just over 100 years ago. Amazingly, the Schwarzschild metric describes the simplest kind of black hole. Einstein himself never believed the implications of his own or Schwarzschild's equations. In 1964, Roy Kerr obtained a metric we now know describes a spinning black hole. And we know it because LIGO measured it. Around the same time, John Wheeler of Princeton coined the term black hole, and he began pushing, shoving, cajoling physicists outside of their comfort zones with his enthusiasm for all kinds of exotic physics. Ray will tell you lots of stories about that. Wheeler practiced a philosophy that he called radical conservatism, whereby he asked, what if we really trust the equations, even in the most extreme circumstances? That strategy has proven effective over and over in physics, and not only among theorists. The experimenters here have used it to good effect. According to Einstein's theory, gravitational waves are oscillating tides that travel at the speed of light. Oscillating tides that travel at the speed of light. Like sound waves, gravitational waves represent deformations of a medium. In this case, the medium is space itself. Also like sound waves, gravitational waves induce motion in matter. The motion happens to be perpendicular to the direction of wave travel, not parallel to it. 
In this way, gravitational waves are more similar to the waves on the surface of a lake created when a stone is dropped into the lake. If you're on a canoe, the way that you know a wave has come past is that you start to bob up and down. With gravitational waves, you're jiggled in two perpendicular directions at once, simultaneously stretched and compressed by a tidal field, just like the continents and oceans are stretched and compressed by lunar tides. We often hear the metaphor of the fabric of space-time. A fabric is easy to deform, but space-time is very, very difficult to deform. It requires enormous mass to measurably deform space-time. The mass of the Earth is barely enough to warp time to a level of 38 microseconds per day. Amazingly, that tiny warpage has a huge effect on GPS navigation. It's much harder to create a measurable warpage propagating wave through space-time. The conversion of three times the rest mass energy of the sun into gravitational wave energy produced a tiny warpage on Earth, and it was measured. What are the implications of the discovery? And how does it compare with the discovery of the Higgs boson? <laughs> LIGO was not constructed to discover gravitational waves. It was built as an observatory. Instead of discovering a phenomenon that completes a standard model, it opens an entirely new way to study places in the universe where electromagnetic waves are nearly useless. For me, the better comparison is with the discovery of exoplanets. We will soon have many examples of black hole and neutron star mergers, and we'll begin to analyze properties of space, time, and matter we only dreamed of measuring before. If the discovery of other stellar systems inspires us to learn more about the universe, the creation of an, an entirely new form of astronomy will do no less. Ray, I cannot express how profoundly grateful I am to be alive at this moment with you and the other colleagues of LIGO sharing the joy of discovery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I stand, unlike my colleagues. It's going to be easier because I, I actually do have slides that I want to point to. Thank, well, first of all, thank you for being here. So Ed mentioned that we detected a, a signal coming from a binary black hole. These are two black holes merging around each other, spiraling around each other and merging together to form a final single black hole. And this is somehow represented in this video. I hope you can see with, in spite of the light above the screen. And no, no, it's because of the light. Uh, the contrast. So the two black holes are here and there, and they should start going around each other. You will notice that they go faster and faster, so the angular velocity increases. Obviously, you know, the light coming from the background is deformed by the strong gravity, and okay, they are getting closer and closer. Eventually, the, 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 the uh, horizon of the two black holes, so the surface in a certain way, the two black holes will get together, and they will disappear to form a single final object that goes back to equilibrium. And this is what we saw with LIGO uh, back in September. And since then, we have become very, very good aligned to family and friends about this. Uh, OK, this is now going to show you the same phenomenon. But this time, instead of just looking at the background uh, universe, we're going to see uh, some other representation of the space time itself and how it is deformed by the two black holes as they get close. On the bottom, I hope you can see, you will see the gravitational wave that they, you know, the, the system produce, which is what mm. arrived, it's not this, what arrives <laughs> at, at Earth. Would have been much easier. Okay, um, so again, you have the two objects piling around each other, and here there is a kind of countdown. And you might see, you know, a progression of the wave from here. The blue track there, this is the gravitational field, obviously it's incredibly deformed where the two black holes live. And it's probably not easy to see, but they're accelerating. And you can see maybe from the waveform that you know, the frequency is increasing because the angular velocity is increasing. They're emitting more and more gravitational wave energy, as you can see from the fact that the amplitude is steadily increasing. And at a certain point, the movie will uh, kind of freeze over the last few orbits. It's probably now. There you go. And what is happening now is that the, you, we're very close to the moment where the two horizons feel each other very strongly. 
the two black holes will merge now. This is the peak of the amplitude of the waveform. A single black hole is formed, but it's not in equilibrium. So he has to release the excess of energy. That's what we call a ring down, and that's the final bit of the waveform. So the space-time, it's releasing the excess of energy, the last you know, flash of, of gravitational wave, and you are left with a you know, care metric around the black hole. So this thing is what we saw, and it's, it's very cool. Sorry if it's not enough to impress you, but uh, you know. Okay, now, uh, this is nice, but we also would like to understand as much as possible you know, uh, from the waveform we saw, the signal we saw, about the two objects that you know, produced and released that energy. And uh, the nice thing is that uh, from general relativity, from Einstein relativity, we know how the gravitational wave signal will look like if we are given the masses, the spin, uh, and the position of the black hole in the field of parameters. And this is how it looks like. You are, it's what you have seen in, in, you know, in the previous slide. Uh, the amplitude increases with time until the two objects merge, and then it goes down. And this is, you would see it's for, I don't know if, I hope you can read, it's for a two black hole of 30 solar masses each, uh, in total. And the mass is equally distributed, it's 15-15. Now, the way we measure the mass of the two black hole, it's because if the mass were different, or the spin were different, the waveform would be a bit different, or very different. So by looking for the waveform that matches best the data we have, we can infer the properties of the black hole. And for example, if in the movie that you are about to see, you will see the black hole increasing their masses, and you will see how the waveform changes. You will see that the amplitude increase, so the same way when you pile up more charges, you know, the, the electrical uh, field is stronger, the same way when you pile up more mass, the gravitational field is stronger. And uh, you probably will not see this, but the waveform gets also shorter and shorter. And uh, there will be sound. We have been inspired by this uh, cartoon that came out in the New Yorker. It's two sharks going around each other and producing waves, okay? And obviously, if the sharks are bigger, the waves will be sh bigger. <laughs> so that's how the music got picked. I hope you will enjoy it as much as we did. <laughs> Just perfect for this. So the amplitude gets bigger and bigger and bigger because the masses are getting bigger. As we went all the way to 100 solar masses, roughly. OK, so looking at the waveform tell us something about the underlying properties of the system. Now, in general, though, there are too many parameters in which a particular system depends, like the masses, the spin, the sky position. We cannot just try all of them in a grid. We rely typically on a more sophisticated method like Monte Carlo. And uh, which is what we have done for this particular you know, a, a detection. And in this movie, you will see, for those of you who like these things, uh, this is the mass of one object. This is the mass of the, of the second object, the two black holes. It's not this particular black holes. It's to give you an idea. So how we estimate this, we just generate a gravitational wave waveform. We check if it looks like the data. If it, not, if it doesn't, we look for a better one, and so on and so forth. And we do that a lot of time. So at the beginning, you're just sampling the parameter space more or less randomly. And now you found the, re the interesting region. So it's probably around 10 solar masses and 10 solar masses. And the points converge there. This is how we estimate the parameter. This is a 2D projection. In reality, there are up to 15 uh, parameters. So it's a very high dimensional problem. It's not trivial. And anyway, it works. You can trust me. So <laughs> by doing this, I mean, there are people spend their night, so it's, it's okay. Okay, so by doing this, uh, we discover a few interesting things about this particular uh, merger of black hole. And so first of all, the masses. These were very high mass black hole. The, uh, the estimated values are 36 and 29 solar masses, okay, where one and sun, as Lisa brilliantly pointed out, is one, the mass of our sun, okay. Now, uh, these are a factor of two more massive than the most massive, what, what we call stellar mass black hole known. I'm obviously excluding the kind of black hole that were you know, referred to before at the center of galaxies. Those are obviously much, much bigger. And the, the fact that they are so massive tell us something about their progenitor. I will come back you know, about this point in a, in a moment. The other quite interesting thing is that they were very far away. This uh, you know, merger happened 
roughly one billion years ago, uh, one billion years like uh, away. Or oh, if you prefer to think in megaparsec, as I do, it's roughly 400 megaparsec. So that's very, very far, okay? Now, if, for those of you who liked interstellar, you know that black holes can spin very, very fast, okay, and drag the space-time around them. So obviously we try to verify if that was the case for our black holes, and unfortunately, it's not. So we could, uh, we could uh, put an upper bound to how fast the two black holes were rotating, and it's uh, a bit you know, less fast than maximum. Okay, it's 0.7 if you like numbers, or 0.8. Okay, next. Uh, so this is very nice, but what does it teach us about the universe? Okay, something, well, a lot of things, but something which is pretty uh, straightforward to, you know, to tell to a broad audience is that the very fact that these two black holes were so massive tell us something about the, the, the stars they were born from. You know, black hole come after a star die. And uh, in particular, and we can come back to this probably during question time if people are interested, it tells us that the amount of metals in the two progenitor stars was not that high. It has to be smaller than half of the metallicity of our own star. So we learned something about the environment and the star from which these two black holes came from. Next. Uh, all of this is true, obviously, if Einstein was wrong, because the waveform we used, you know, at the zero torque, there are GR waveform. So did we trust him blindly? No, we didn't. We, we checked. There were several tests we were able to, able to perform to verify if the waveform that we saw in the data was compatible with what we would expect from Einstein general relativity. And uh, there are several of them. Uh, one of them, which is probably the nicest, is that if GR is correct, uh, you know, gravitational waves, as it was said, are supposed to travel at the speed of light. So, uh, in other words, if GR is wrong, the particle that mediates, you can think in a quantum way, the gravitational field will have a mass. And we were able to put an upper bound on how massive a potential, you know, a hypothetical graviton can be. And that bound was a factor of uh, three better than what uh, you could do with solar system tests, and a factor of 10 to the three better than what was able to, people were able to do with the most relativistic system known before this one, which is a double pulsar. Okay, so a factor of 10 to the three better. Okay, now, those of you who care about black hole will be worried at this point because what happened to the two black holes? They're gone, obviously. They formed this new black hole, which is around uh, in the universe somewhere, and uh, we obviously try to estimate the properties of the black hole that is left, and we saw that its total mass was, was 62 solar masses. Now, for those of you who did a math in the audience, and I assume there will be some, uh, <laughs> three solar masses are disappeared. If you take the difference between this and the initial black hole masses, three solar masses are gone, and what happened to them, obviously, is that they have been converted in gravitational wave energy and you know, radiated away. And that may not seem very impressive, but let me compare with something we know very well, which is our own star. So our sun, if you, if you make the math very easily, in its five billion years, as radiators has lost 0.03% of its mass in, tri in five billion years. Our merger of two black hole in 0.2 seconds has radiated away three times the mass of our sun. So this is a huge amount of energy. During this amount of time, this 0.2 second, the, the energy emitted by this system was larger than the, you know, electromagnetic energy coming from the rest of the universe combined, okay? And in spite of this huge amount of energy, it still took an incredibly sensitive instrument, uh, such as, uh, as LIGO, to detect these gravitational waves. And now, Lisa will explain you why it was so complicated. Thank you. Very nice. Okay, thank you very much for coming. It's, it's really great for me and for all my friends who have been working on this for so many years to see that so many people care. So it's really <laughs> rewarding. <laughs> okay, so my job is to explain why it took Ray Wise and many of us nearly 50 years to actually detect gravitational waves if gravitational waves are associated with such incredibly energetic events. Why is so hard? So let's go uh, back for a second. And uh, unfortunately, with this light is hard to see. Here are these two black holes. 
And now let's follow what happens to the gravitational waves as they propagate away from the source through Earth. So this is the new black hole we just formed. Gravitational waves propagate away from the source and go through space. And so, as we said, they modify the space around them. And once they reach the Earth, that's our chance to detect it. And now, this video is actually very, very, very much exaggerated, <laughs> the effect <laughs> of this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are still all alive, so that's not exactly what happened. <laughs> but you get the point. So as we heard earlier, so let's look at this in a uh, slightly more realistic way. So what happens is the gravitational wave propagates here. So it goes, the direction of, of propagation is through this tube. And so what, what it does is that it stretches and squeezing space around it. In the, in the plane, is perpendicular to the propagation of, of the wave. So you can imagine that if you can put some masses that are free to move, and those are represented by this red dot here, you could actually measure this effect. So you, you take one of these circle, it's here, and when the wave arrives, you see one direction is stretched and the other one is, is squeezed. So if you want to do this a little bit more um, quantitatively, so what you want to measure is the effect of the wave. So how much uh, these, these free masses have been displaced, which is this delta L here. And the effect is actually a strain over the distance of this, of between these test masses. So the, the basic and the, the very basic formula that you have to keep in mind to understand this phenomenon is that the uh, displacement of these masses over their separation is h, where h is the amplitude of the wave that, uh, that Salvo just described. And now, all the problem here is that this amplitude of the wave is very, very small. It's 10 to the minus 21 is 1 with 20 zero in front of it. So it's very, 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 very small. <laughs> and so you can look at this in a, a, you know, you can move this formula around. And so for us, what, what matters is how do we measure this displacement delta L induced by the wave? And you can see here, you know, you cannot do anything about H. That's small, that's nature. We, we can't control that. But what we can do to make this delta L as big as possible is to put these masses far apart and so make L as long as possible. Uh, so if we go back to the movie that I showed you before, right? If, uh, in principle, if you could displace these test masses uh, along the Earth and use the entire Earth, then the number that you would get is, you know, is still pretty small. Like, even if <laughs> you could put these masses so far apart, like the radius of the Earth is 6,000 kilometers, still, this number is, is pretty small, 10 to the minus 14 meter, right? Um, okay, it's small, but, you know, someone might say, okay, it's not that, that small. Uh, you know, Michelson in 1887, with a, a simple tabletop experiment was able to measure something that was of the order of nanometers, so 10 to the nine. Um, you know, it's, it's far away from what we want to measure, but it gives you the idea that there is a way in which we can actually measure small displacement. And so 10 to the minus, you know, five 10 to the minus nine, it's hard to grasp, but what we have put here is the hydrogen atom. And so the size of an hydrogen atom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. So that would give you the scale of, of what we are, we are trying to do. So how is that a Michelson interferometer actually works and how is it sensitive to gravitational waves? So what you're going to see here is what's the effect of the waves as they propagate through a Michelson interferometer. And here, the, you, here we go back to our picture. The mirrors of the Michelson interferometer are our red balls, the masses that are free to move. And so here you see the passage of the gravitational waves. You have a laser source, and then 
when the waves arrive, they move the mirrors. Again, not like this. This is <laughs> way, way too much. So let's go back from the beginning. The laser source, the laser beam is split at, the, at what we call the beam splitter, and uh, the, the light is reflected by the end mirrors, recombine at the beam splitter here, and we control the Michelson such that no light uh, goes this way through a photo detector that we, we use to make a measurement. But when the gravitational waves arrive, you see that the phase of these uh, beams actually changes, and you do get some light. And that's how we can actually make the measurement. So what the, this, the modulation of the laser amplitude here on this photodetector encodes the parameters of the waves that Salvo was talking to you about. And so that's actually the mechanism by which we can indeed perform the measurement. Now, let's go back for a second to the numbers, right? Uh, now, at this point, you say, okay, great, but it's not like you can build an interferometer, which, you know, where he has the arm, which is as, as long as the radius of the Earth. That doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So let's, let's, let's pick another number, for example, four kilometers, and see what do you need to do, uh, uh, what do you need to measure if you could make an interferometer which has four kilometer arms, right? And so let's go back. You recall this H is the amplitude of the wave, the small, very small number, 10 to the minus 21, and now you say, okay, let's put four kilometer here. What do you get? We get something which is very, very small. Four, 10 to the minus 18 meter. This is nine order of magnitudes smaller than what Michelson could do. And this is so small that it's actually very hard to uh, think about it. And so here, let's go back to our hydrogen atom. So I told you earlier that 10 to the minus 10 is the size of, of an atom, right? And now what you will see is a movie, and every square that you see is a zoom by a factor of 10. So it's a, it's a factor of 10 smaller size. So let's play it. So we start with the uh, hydrogen, this electron going around, and then one, two, three, four, five, I stop counting, you go <laughs> down to the proton, and this tiny thing is what you want to measure. This is incredible. Like, what we want to measure, like, every time I think about this, it's like, wow, we are superhero. Like, how can we possibly do this? Like, it's really incredible. Sorry, that wasn't planned, but that's <laughs> right. So the point I was trying to make is what we want to do is really, really difficult. And so you could imagine, you know, poor Michelson say, yeah, whatever. That seems pretty hopeless, guys. Where are you going? And then fortunately, someone else <laughs> was brave enough Okay, and so, uh, and now we're, we're here today because Ray Wise and many other people for 50 years actually worked really hard to make this measurement possible. So now let's go back and, 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 and look at what the LIGO uh, interferometers look like. So, uh, you know, we have two uh, four kilometer interferometer in the United States. One is in, located in Washington State the other one is in Louisiana, the opposite side of, of, of the country. Um, if you go to the site today, the first thing that you would see is this four kilometer, there are two, you would see these two uh, four kilometer cement tubes. This is actually me standing on top of it to give you a sense of scale. Uh, the laser beam actually travels in a tube which is inside this one, and it's 1.2 meter. Uh, diameter. If you walk inside this building here, uh, where the beam splitter, the 
uh, sits, you would see, I'm sorry this is uh, kind of dark, uh, it's a hard, to, hard to say, but here there is the vacuum system where we put our mirrors in so they don't get disturbed and they can act as, as, as free masses. There is a guy here which is, who is two meters tall and this is, uh, you, you see it like uh, very, very big. Okay, so if you could actually look inside the vacuum system, you would see something that resembles the, the simple Michaels interferometer that I showed you uh, earlier. So we have here a very powerful laser that we can use. And um, what we do is actually we use several, uh, we call it tricks, they're actually uh, very co complicated technology developments in such a way that we can actually amplify the light that is circulating this interferometer. Because the more light you have, the more you essentially amplify the effect of the wave. And so here it's the same picture that I showed you before. Uh, once the gravitational waves arrive and, and, and interact with the interferometer, what happens is that this mirror moves and you get a signal here. And we use a, a photo detector that converts the light that is there, that arrives on it, in current, and then we send this current through a resistor, and we make a voltage out of it. And uh, this, this signal is then, you know, it's voltage, you can send it in a speaker, uh, and because uh, LIGO operates in the audio band, you can actually listen to it. And the other important piece of it is that, of course, uh, you know, this, this signal here has both the noise of the interferometer and the gravitational wave signal on it. So that's the combination of the two. We have no way to distinguish, right? Okay. Um, so I told you uh, advanced LIGO operate in the, in the audio band. And so the nice thing about this is that we can actually listen to gravitational waves as they are converted in this signal by our interferometer. And so now I'm going to play um, this, this, this movie. Um, so first of all, I just listen to it without caring too much about what's displayed, and then I will explain what you're actually seeing. So for now, listen to it. So you will, what you will hear is the sound of the gravitational waves converted by the interferometer for the event that LIGO observed. You, you will hear it twice, and then since it's kind of hard to hear for, uh, for humans at that frequency, it's shifted up in frequency uh, so that it's easy, easier to hear. But you know, there is only one, one event that we detected. We, we played it four times, but it's, it's, it's only one. That's the second. So you hear this woo, it's the noise, and then you have the chirp sound. Uh, and that's, that's what we detect. And you say, you worked 50 years for this woo. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know the feeling, I know. <laughs> so let's now look at this, at this plot. You have time in the x-axis and uh, versus frequency. So uh, these two signals here are the signals produced by, the interfer by the both interferometers. The top is the one in Washington State, the other one in Louisiana as, as a function of time. While these other uh, curves here are actually um, time, uh, it's actually the frequency of the, of the sound that you just heard. And you see that they have this uh, particular feature that they incre the, the, the signal increases in, in frequency. Okay. Um, so we have a standard way of characterizing the noise of our interferometer. So you see this signal here. This is, uh, recall, it's the interferometer noise plus the gravitational waves uh, in, in, in time. What we, the way in which we like to, um, to look at the noise of the interferometer is actually in the frequency domain. So here you have the noise of the interferometer uh, calibrated in strain uh, as function of frequency. And these two curves show you what was the noise of both the, uh, the, two, detect the two LIGO detectors at the time of the black hole merger. And what you can see here is that 
uh, first of all, the frequency is in, in, you know, around 100 hertz, so it's something that indeed we can hear. And the noise in the two instruments was pretty comparable, pretty much, pre pretty much the same. Uh, and now Matt will tell you more about how we characterize the noise of the instrument. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody for uh, being here. I guess I get to give the least exciting part of the talk, but uh, I'm gonna tell you about you know, what is this noise that determines how sensitive the instrument is and, and how that determines the sort of uh, astrophysics we do and really where we're going in the future with these instruments. So the curves here I'm showing are similar to the ones that Lisa just put up. The green one here is the previous best. There was a previous generation of LIGO uh, no one got excited about it in the media because we didn't detect anything. Um, <laughs> this is the, the current sensitivity. That's uh, the one we made the detection with. And you see this, these blue curves look a little too good to be real because that's where we're going in the future. So that's what we calculate as the sensitivity of advanced LIGO. The design here is where we hope to go with the current detectors. And then this light blue one is where we're going in the future. So I'll kind of walk us through those. <laughs> Uh, this is to show these same things, but in cartoon version. I'm going to use this cartoon for my explanation. So again, on this axis, we have the frequency of the noise. And 10 hertz down here, uh, the audio files are recognized that as kind of the bottom of the band that you could hope to get out of a speaker. And 10 kilohertz up here is close to the top of the uh, audio band, the kind of thing that you could hear. And you can see that our noise is high at low frequency and kind of high at high frequency and better in, in the middle. So this is the amplitude of the noise, and that's the frequency of the noise. And I'll explain why it has this shape and how we went from here, which was the initial LIGO curve, to where we are now. The first fundamental uh, noise that we have is, it comes from quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics tells us that light is made of photons. So you can think of light as being a bunch of little balls that go flying around. And the way that we get our signal on the photodetector is that these photons arrive, and more or less we just count the photons as they come in. And it's kind of a statistical process. They arrive randomly. You count all the photons. And that random arrival time gives you some noise. That might be sort of intuitive. There's a, there's a more sort of curious thing, which is that these photons actually bounce off of our mirrors. These are, these are big mirrors. They're like 40 kilograms, 90 pounds, something like that. And the photons bouncing off of them actually cause a noise in our detector by radiation pressure noise. So all these little photons bouncing off of the mirrors cause the mirrors to move around. And that limits our ability to measure gravitational waves because the mirrors, mirrors move due to the photons. They also move due to gravitational waves. So these two noises compete. That's this bottom side is the radiation pressure noise. So here's our counting the photons as they arrive at our detectors. This is the photons kicking the mirrors around. And hopefully this will be uh, a sound which kind of tells you what this part of the noise spectrum looks like. It's mainly high frequency stuff. Kind of uh, rain on a tin roof. Sort of thing. So that's the high frequency noise in our detector. The next noise is something we refer to as thermal noise. And this comes from the fact that our mirrors are made of some material which is not at absolute zero temperature. So all the molecules in the material are sort of wiggling around. And when you try to measure the position of the mirror to an accuracy which is this horribly subatomic, sub ter terrible thing, you might say you couldn't possibly do that. All the molecules are wiggling more than that. But we make the laser use really big, and we average over a lot of these molecules. And it's that averaging which lets us beat down the noise and have good sensitivity. So that's our thermal noise. That's this part of the noise spectrum. And that comes from the molecules wiggling around. You call it Brownian motion. It sounds kind of like this. It's lower frequency components, more of a stormy sea. And at the very bottom end, uh, we get a lot of questions about, like, how do you know it was a gravitational wave and not just the red line? Or <laughs> some pickup truck, or maybe someone kicked one of the vacuum chambers and the mirror moved. Like, how can you tell the difference? Uh, we work really hard to isolate the mirrors of the interferometer from ground motion. We call it seismic motion, but it's any sort of vibration coming in from the outside world. I'll show you some pictures of the isolation systems. They're very large, they're very impressive, they're very expensive. And what they do is they cut off all of these vibrations to keep that noise down at low frequency, so out of our band. And it's just a low frequency rumble that you might have heard in the sounds that Lisa played. So 
this is a lower frequency than the thermal noise kind of thing, just this rumbling in the background. To be perfectly honest, I had to move it up in frequency a bit, because if it was really at 10 hertz, you just wouldn't hear it, right? So I pushed that one up a little bit so you could get something. Okay, so now that you know what the fundamental noises are in the detector, I can try to tell you how we got from our previous best to where we are now and where we're going in the future. The simple way to put this, Nurgis said this very nicely at the press conference, is we got better everything, better everything in advanced LIGO. And what that means is that the ground vibration has to now go through these enormous seismic isolation, isolation systems. The top picture here is uh, the active isolation system. And this thing is, what, six, seven feet across, two meters across? And that's all one big piece of aluminum. Like, how do you even get a mill that big? The thing is enormous. And so our isolators are these huge aluminum blocks that are all bolted together with a bunch of seismometers. And we use those to measure the ground motion as it's transmitted in and then push on the things to try to keep it very still. This then has to go down through a chain of passive isolation. So it's a bunch of masses and springs kind of thing. And eventually it propagates down through this and gets to our mirrors. And this is one of the advanced LIGO optics. Uh, in Hanford, and again, it's, it's like this big. It's, it's a very large piece of glass. And we got extremely high quality glass, and we made the things very large, and this combination gives us low thermal noise. So the quality of the glass tells you how much of the noise couples into your measurement, and the size of it is how much you can spread out your laser beam to try to average over the surface. The last feature here is our big scary laser, and we got like 10 times more laser power for advanced LIGO. And you, you wouldn't want to you know, put your hand in it or anything. It's, it's a very bad idea. This is a CW laser, so continuous output. And the laser itself is putting out about 120 watts. You know, 120 light, watt light bulb doesn't sound very scary, but if it's all in a little laser beam, it's, 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 uh, yeah, it's a big, scary laser. It, it has its own room all to itself. Hmm. And uh, we're still actually learning how to use the output of the laser. So the you know, advanced light was not done. We got to the sort of red-pink curves that are there, and that was, this was our first observing run. I'll, I have to say we got very lucky. We didn't really expect <laughs> to detect anything in the first observing run, but we did. And, and that makes us even more hopeful for the future because we still have a lot of work we can do on these detectors. We can use all the laser power that's available. We'll have a whole bunch of technical problems that Ray is already worrying about um, that we have to deal with as we turn off the laser power. But we could get almost another factor of three in terms of the sensitivity here. And, and that's huge. It'll mean we'll get a lot more black holes. I mean, let me tell you exactly why that factor of three is. It's not just three times as many black holes. It's, it's much better than that. So if you, if you have a binary black hole system like the one we detected, and it's sweeping up in frequency, you heard it kind of go whoop up in frequency, that's this pink thing here. And the little pop at the end is that little kind of phony explosion. So if this thing is at 400 megaparsecs, it would make a signal like this in this cartoon. If I put the source 10 times farther away, then it gets 10 times weaker. So this is four gigaparsecs, same system. The scales, the scales with one over R. And this system here, we could detect easily with our detector sensitivity, current one. But if the thing was at four gigaparsecs, we wouldn't have picked that up, right? But maybe at design sensitivity, we would have just been able to detect that. So we actually quantify the sensitivity of our detectors to various sources in terms of the distance at which we can detect them. What's the farthest away you could put this thing and still pick it up in, in the detector above the noise? So if you have the distance, then that tells you about how much space you're sensitive to. So to give us an idea, here's, here's Earth, and here's the Milky Way galaxy, and here we are, a tiny little galaxy, and this cluster of galaxies is the Virgo cluster. And initial LIGO was sensitive to you know, a certain distance, but you can turn it into a volume, and that's this little ball. And then if you say, okay, advanced LIGO is actually 10 times more sensitive, so it's sensitive to everything here. These are like the local superclusters of galaxies. And the volume of that purple ball is 1,000 times bigger than the volume of the little red ball. So a factor of 10 in sensitivity gets you a factor of 1,000 in volume. You have 1,000 times more galaxies, you'll have 1,000 times more black holes, right? That's great. So, a little step in sensitivity, like this factor of three, might not seem like much, but we get three cubed out of that in terms of the event rate. So we got one already. I mean, if you multiply by 30, it's, it's awesome. Um, so I put some numbers here. Roughly 50 black hole binaries merge each year in a cubic gigaparsec. A cubic gigaparsec is an enormous space. There are about 10 million galaxies in a cubic gigaparsec. 
I, I weigh my galaxies as Milky Way equivalents, but anyway, don't worry about that. Um, and then the distance to which we can detect a particular source depends on the mass of the source, but the scale is about the same, about a gigaparsec. Right? So the biggest things, we would see them out to a gigaparsec. We put all these numbers together, and you say, LIGO's gonna, you know, people like us will go there and turn the screws for a few months, and we'll try to make things better. And somewhere around the end of this year, we're gonna start taking data again. How many black holes do you think we're gonna detect, you know, by the end of next year? The, the, the math tells us something like five, could be more, could be 10, we might get lucky again, who knows? Um, I don't think we're gonna get a, as much press for every one of these as we did for the first one. <laughs> really? Right? You can't be on the cover of the New York Times every single time. But, but the astrophysics you get out of this actually gets better and better. So we get more and more of these things. We actually learn about the population of black holes that are out there. We start doing more and more interesting science. So the first event is great. It tells us a lot of things we didn't know. Uh, but more events is, is better. So as we move then from you know, imagine we do our work and everything goes well. In a few years, we get to design sensitivity, and then we're thinking about how do we make these things better. And actually, we're thinking now about how do we get past the design sensitivity down the road. And the way we do that is with uh, research happening in the labs. And I'll talk about, of course, this is at MIT Fest, so I'll talk about research happening here at MIT. But this picture is actually in NW17 basement, one of the experiments going on here at MIT. And in particular, this one has to do with, uh, we'd like to improve the sensitivity of the detector by using a little bit of quantum optics. We want to use squeeze states of light. So I told you that we have noise from photons in our detector. If we can order our photons in a, in a better way, we can actually reduce the noise. So we want to use squeezed light, and we have experiments going on here uh, in the MIT LIGO lab to try to produce squeezed light for advanced LIGO. We're also trying to make the thermal noise lower. So, lower. so we have these uh, mirror coatings, and if we can get just the right mirror materials, we can reduce the thermal noise in our detectors. So here we're trying to measure the thermal noise in a lab scale and then use that to find ways to get better materials and uh, improve our thermal noise. The next really big leap in detectors comes from making something which is longer. Fundamentally in this business, uh, you know, a longer detector gives you better sensitivity. It's, it's very hard to beat that factor of L. So, we're also thinking hard about where to go in the longer term. Can we build a 40 kilometer detector? Is that completely insane? Could it work? I don't know. Um, for the moment, it looks like 40 kilometers is not completely crazy, and 400 kilometers is completely crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're thinking about this also, and that gets us in the sort of 20 years, 15, 20 year kind of time horizon. And all of this is going on here at MIT, and I want to return to a point that Ray made at the beginning of this which is uh, our progress is very heavily dependent on students. Uh, the work that happens in the labs here is mostly done by graduate students. I think it wouldn't be wrong for me to say I haven't been in the lab with that green laser that you saw for a few months at least. I, I would be embarrassed just to tell you the truth about how long it's been since I've been in that lab. We have students in there working hard all the time, and a lot of the work that's done is students and postdocs spending long hours in the lab really turning out results, and, mm -hmm. and that, that's what really keeps things moving. And it's, it's, not, it's not only true here, it's also true at the observatories. You might think that these observatories are these big, sort of ominous things out in the desert, nobody goes there, or maybe it's just like old scientist people. Sorry, I didn't mean to look at you, Mike. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the truth is that the people who make those work are also graduate students. And it's because graduate students can work 16 hours a day, Six, we don't tell them they have to. It's so exciting. They're just in there in the control room, and they'll work six or seven days a week. You have to send them home, right? And there's, the, there's a couch. They'll sleep on the couch. It's incredible. So, so a lot of the work is done by students. The vast majority of the work on these things is done by students. And, and we send students to the observatories, and, and they're the real engines that drive this whole process forward. So that's... that's uh, I say kudos to all the students, and it's also an invitation to all the students. We, we need students, we love students, and yeah, <laughs> we'll send you to the desert. <laughs> <laughs> or to the swamp, one of the two. But anyway, um, all right, so the last point I wanted to make is that LIGO isn't actually the only way to detect gravitational waves, and this audio band isn't the only band you can find gravitational waves in. So as we think about the future of gravitational wave science and what we can do with this new tool we have, we have to look at all the sort of different uh, wavelengths of gravitational waves or frequencies of gravitational waves that you could, you could imagine investigating. I've been talking to you about this highest part 
of the gravitational wave frequency band, where you have to get you know, very, very compact objects like black holes to go around each other as fast as things spin in your blender at home, and then these two, you know, 60 solar masses at blender speeds collide, and we detect it here. And that's the top end. And you can get more and more massive things which produce gravitational waves at lower and lower frequencies. So these could be like supermassive black holes uh, as galaxies come together. You might detect those with uh, pulsar timing, for instance. And I, I guess you guys might have heard of BICEP. Um, so this is a great experiment, and it will work. And they're looking for uh, gravitational waves from the Big Bang, basically. And that's the lowest frequencies, one over the age of the universe kind of frequency. So there's a, there's a huge you know, range of gravitational wave frequencies that you could hope for. There are many different technologies that you can use to find them. This includes space-based detectors. Uh, LIGO is just, is just one way of doing this. And we happen to get there first, and we think that's great. But in terms of the science that's to be done, there's this new tool we have and a, and a great new way of, of doing astrophysics and learning about the universe. So let me sort of summarize. The, the first thing is we learn the general relativity is correct, even in the strong field regime. I, I don't think we really, really, really were sure of that until now. And, and as far as we can tell, our signal is completely consistent with general relativity and well predicted by it. So that's, that's awesome. Uh, these large stellar mass black holes, well, we didn't know how many were out there. We didn't even know if they existed. Now we know they exist, we know they exist in binaries, and we know they merge in less than the age of the universe. So that's really good news for us because we have a big signal. Um, it also tells us a lot about the universe and how things work out there. Uh, this, this third point is sort of maybe a personal one. Uh, a lot of us were working for a very long time on this, and just the fact that it actually works is really huge for us, right? <laughs> you really can detect gravitational waves with a laser interferometer. And we didn't spend the last you know, 50 years <laughs> trying to do something that was impossible. So, so that's, that's wonderful. It even worked before they cut our funding, so. <laughs> Great. Um, OK, and then having you know, reached that milestone, I can say this is, this is just the beginning. There's a huge amount of science to do and a totally new way of investigating the universe out there. So stay tuned for more gravitational wave sounds. You'll get more of these funny little chirps and little thumps and things like that <laughs> because now we can hear things from the universe. And you could imagine that the, the silent movie is, is over. We've now got sounds from the stars. Have a, we have some more time, and if you have questions, you're going to have to come to a microphone. Because, first of all, there are people in another place that have to hear the questions, and sometimes you can't hear the questions from the way of the back room. So you've got to use the microphone to be acknowledged. So go ahead. So uh, congratulations on this incredible uh, discovery. My question is primarily for Ray Weiss, but for anybody. So one of the things I've wondered about you know, over the last 50 years, a billion dollars has been spent, a huge infrastructure at the observatories, t reams of scientists are working on this. And so I've just wondered, over this time, have you held on to the belief that this was really going to happen? Or have you felt like, oh my god, I have this huge caravan behind me and that, you know, nothing's going to happen here? So I'm just curious how you thought about that over all these decades. Well, you know I've thought about it, and I'll tell you how I thought about it. I mean, the, the thing is, you never look at the end. If you did that, if you looked, let's say, in 1968, whatever, whenever the hell we started this, and uh, you go and say, well, you know, you're not going to detect anything until 2015. If that's all you thought about, you'd never go, you'd never get it done. And the thing is, the pleasure of it is the fact that all the things that are along the way are fun. If it isn't fun, you won't do it. And so, you know, the thing is, if you don't enjoy making that circuit work or fixing the vacuum system, or whatever is necessary, and you don't get a pleasure out of the fact that what you calculate works, you won't sustain a long effort. So you never think about the end point. You think of what's in front of you right now. That's number one. Number two is you find out that in the process of doing that, you meet a lot of very interesting people who are lovely to work with. And that's the thing that sustains you. So you know, you don't think of the end point. 
think of the process. Okay, I, that's the best I can tell you. So my question is more of like a personal... We can't hear you, so get closer to the mic. I can do that. Oh, wow. Uh, my question is a little bit more like on the personal side, and uh, I wanted to know like how did you find out about the chirp that was this binary system colliding or combining, and how did it get passed on, and how did you all keep it to yourselves when there's like a thousand uh, scientists yeah. involved? Yeah. That's my question. I, I can answer this. Uh, can you hear me? Okay with a, some personal notes too. Because I, just by poor, you know, time zone luck, happened to be the first person, as far as I know, to see the value of the masses, you know, and the spin and so on and so forth, because I, I run the parameter estimation algorithm that does that. And it was, <laughs> okay, at first, we thought it was something like, not weird, but you know, that. Sometimes we put a signal ourselves in the data to check that you know, everything works all right in the pipelines or the algorithms that are supposed to find them. So I thought, okay, this is what happened, you know. And then as the hours, so I send an email, we have several mailing lists, and as the hour passed and went through, you know, people like Matt started checking, and said, no, there is nothing, you know. Uh, so it was very, there were very, 24 very emotional hours. <laughs> When that happened, and furthermore, I was a, at home visiting my family, so I ended up being lock, locking myself in the, in, the, in the room. I couldn't tell them anything because we swore sacred secrecy. It's like the FBI. Um, <laughs> so, and at least personally, I had to lie to them until I told them the night of Christmas, you know, for dinner. And uh, my mom obviously told me, how does it change my life? Okay, anyway, I don't know if that answered really your question. <laughs> But no, it was I'm very personal and very emotional yeah. from our side. So in, no, more scientifically, um, as one of the m slides that Matt or Lisa showed, uh, actually told you what the signal looks like in the data. And this is raw data without any strange data analysis. You just take the data of LIGO, you get rid of the low and the high frequencies, and you see the signal is there. It looks like a chirp. It sounds like a chirp. It's a chirp. Okay. <laughs> So all the fancy data analysis only refined our understanding and told us how big were the, the masses, how far away that was, in which part of the sky, and so on and so forth. Uh, but it was screamingly you know, loud in the data. It was, it was beautiful. Can I, get a ring, can I get a ring tone that's the chirp? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Thank you. Let me go to you. Yeah. So, so what part of the Earth got hit first with the wave? And did one of your detectors detect the wave before the other due to their difference in location? So by seven milliseconds, and they're very proud about it. Okay. So, yeah, <laughs> so, so, so where, what part arrived, of the Earth did arrived hit? from the south, so the Livingstone south. got the data, the signal first, and okay. then uh, uh, Enford at the point, and they're very proud at the point that when one of our students was in Livingstone, he draw, you know, uh, and the signal is coming from here, and just, it was a random drawing, and he put it coming from north, and someone from the audience said, no, 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 it came from there, it's right. us first. So we are not competitive. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Ed. Yes. You uh, measure amplitude. Now, light from the sun, you measure intensity, which is the square of the amplitude. The intensity from the sun goes down as the inverse square of the radius or distance. Does the, does the signal that you are looking at go down linearly with the, risen, with the distance? because you are measuring amplitude instead of intensity. Exactly, no, I think you've answered your own question. <laughs> <laughs> it, it goes down yeah. as linearly because it's amplitude as, as Matt says. So it's one over one over, one over the distance. Right, the the luminosity. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Go ahead, yeah, please. I'd just like to thank you for the um, great opportunity for everyone to be here and the, for the great discovery, but I do have a question now. I bet a lot of college students and a lot of universities want to jump on the bandwagon like Caltech, MIT, and a bunch of other places. Mm. How are you going to deal with this influx, like a um, like new wave of Can college I, students and scientists that we want to? We are not to? going yeah. anywhere. Well, let me try to answer that because I think you, the influx you're talking about has already happened. <laughs> uh, we haven't made a big fuss in this room about something called the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, which is something like uh, 90 other institutions that have been working with us for many years now, since about uh, 1997, in fact. 
that has been open to many universities, many government centers have, are part of this, and there are about 1,000 people associated with that collaboration. And I think what the thing that is so admirable is that we were able to write a paper, and the, Peter Fritchell, would you stand up? Where are you? <laughs> Come on, stand up, God damn it. Right. There he is, stand up. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was able to, to, to herd that bunch of cats. <laughs> okay? All right? So there are a lot of people. I'm hoping, for example, that many of these places will now take it even more seriously and appoint some faculty. <laughs> here, here. I think that's the best I can answer. There's, it's nothing new. I mean, we, this has been going on much larger than MIT and Caltech. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, hello, like many of you, uh, I also feel that it's a very exciting time to, to we hear. We can't hear you. Get oh, close to the mic. Like many of you, I also feel like it's a very exciting time to hear of all these discoveries. But I do want to ask you, um, do you feel like LIGO could be used to increase our understanding of gravity at a theoretical level and ultimately um, the development or refinement of a grand unified theory? You take it. Well, the answer is absolutely yes. And uh, in fact, from the ring down of that first waveform, that's the best confirmation that we have of general relativity in the presence of very strong gravitational fields. I must tell you, I'm a bit disappointed that it didn't deviate from general relativity. <laughs> um, but I think we'll have many more opportunities to test general relativity when other systems are discovered where the black hole spin plays a role in the in spiral. That'll give us more ways of testing general relativity and other aspects of the phenomena. And it will drive theorists like, like myself back to the drawing boards to ask how can we how can we adapt um, our theories to, to try and go beyond general relativity as we feel we must in order to reconcile gravity with quantum mechanics? Um, so LIGO has shut the door on a lot of our attempts to reconcile gravity and quantum mechanics, and that means uh, the theorists are going to have to work harder. Thank you very much. Any kind of something? Great, great. Go ahead. So I was wondering... No, you, want, you, want, no, sorry, no you, want, you want to say something? Yeah, maybe I can add something that... Uh, this is, so we did, as I, as I said, we performed tests of GR with this signal, but we can do better because the truth is that due to the large masses, um, there were just a few cycles of the gravitational wave forming our LIGO band sensitivity was of the order of 20, okay? And uh, if later on, I mean, without if, we will detect lighter black holes, which will spend more time in our, in our band, which means that we can follow the phase for a, a longer amount of time and do more precise tests of GR. So I kind of, when I saw Matt's slide, I said GR is, is, is correct. I said, no, it's, not, it's correct at a 10% you know, maybe level. We, we'll do more stringent t tests later on. You know, we always test the theory continuously. No, thanks. Go ahead, thanks. Hi, I was wondering what uh, you could do to get a little better location, what exact direction that the uh, gravity wave came from. Also, would it buy you anything to run optical fibers around the entire Earth and make a <laughs> ring, ring interferometers? I'll take that one, but you take the position. Go ahead. Okay, for the position, the, the best thing that we can do is uh, add more detectors. So there is the uh, Italian detector that where I come from in, in, in Pisa, um, and they are supposed to, to come online possibly by the end of 2016. Uh, and then, you know, the more detectors you have, the better you can triangulate the position on the sky. There is another detector that is also uh, under construction right now in Japan, in the Kamioka mine, uh, where Kamiokande is. Um, and they're also <laughs> expected to join the observation sometimes in 2017, 2018. Um, and then um, there is another detector uh, that it's a copy of the LIGO detectors that is going to be placed in India. And I think at this point, yeah, I can say strong. it is going to be placed in India. It was recently <laughs> announced that there would be another one. So with these five detectors, uh, we can actually uh, constrain the location on the sky much or an order of magnitude better than what we can do, at least a matter of 
or did it no, that's good. Bad? Let me let me answer the other question. Where are you? Who asked the question? You asked yeah. if I understand you right. You understood you properly. You say why can't we have a set of fibers that go around it, which we do have. We have a fiber coupling that goes all around the world. Why not use that? Well, I'll give you the answer. In fact, that was one of the first worries that people had when we started proposing LIGO back in the 80s. They said, why don't you do it with fibers? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with that. Fibers are very noisy. They are, ther they are thermal noise elements. They, they jiggle. The molecules inside of them are making such, such a large amount of index fluctuations that you can't use them for this kind of a measurement. You would have to do something quite special with them. Uh, and so I don't think that's a practical way, and they don't take enough power to get you the sensitivity either. So there's really a couple of problems with fibers. But it was thought about. I just want to assure you that people didn't miss something like that, because you know, it's so cheap. You know? <laughs> uh, from the down there. Yes, do we think of these as spherical waves, or is it the, like you said something like the ocean wave? Uh, they're, they're not spherical waves. Um, th technically, there's something called quadrupolar waves. Maybe I can explain it this way, that the orbital plane causes the waves to travel in a preferred direction. In fact, um, it's, a perpendic it's not perpendicular. It's, it's actually in the... Along the most of the energy goes along Most L. of the energy go, right, goes along the, the perpendicular to that plane. So, um, now, that, that's not highly directional. Um, and on the other side, the detectors, individual detectors, are also not highly directional. This is unlike, let's say, an optical telescope, which a single telescope can look in a given direction on the sky. That's not true with gravitational wave detectors. And it's, it's because of the combination of two things. One is the character of the waves, but, but also, very importantly, the wavelength is larger than the size of the telescopes. It's comparable to the size of the orbit of the, of the black holes. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, in terms of technology development, uh, what will it take to be able to detect gravitational waves from all sorts of astronomical objects? Like, can we one day be able to detect gravitational waves from planets and stars? I'm having trouble understanding you. Could you just... Oh, I'll, I'll say it louder. Uh, in terms of technology development, uh, what will it take to be able to detect gravitational waves from all sorts of astronomical objects? Like, can we one day be able to expect to detect gravitational waves from like planets and stars instead of like you know um, massive or large sources of gravitational waves if I understand you right I think that's you know what generates gravitational waves are accelerating masses right and and in fact as Ed was saying they're not just simply accelerating masses you have to worry about that they're quadrupole you have things which a spherically expanding thing just completely spherically expanding and contracting will not radiate gravitational waves because it's very much like Newton. There's something called Birkhoff's theorem in general theory of relativity, which says that something that's spherically expanding or contracting looks always like it's coming from the center, the same thing you were taught for Newton. So you have to have a very special kind of motion, which is what Ed was talking about, to get radiation in the first place. And it needs acceleration, but it needs acceleration that has a quadrupolar character. OK? Great. Can I, can I yeah. try also? Yeah. Um, so. The reason why we don't get gravitational waves from planets uh, is, is because they're not massive enough and they don't move fast enough. Oh, I enough. see. That's the question. I didn't know. Um, and that's true, especially for ground-based detectors, uh, that we're looking for something which is a high frequency. So like I said, these black holes were moving around each other 75 times per second. So it's close to the speed of light. So you need something which is massive, like many times the mass of the sun, and going close to the speed of light in a very tight circle. And, and if you have just, like, let's say, two stars like our sun, and you try to measure gravitational wave radiation from them, uh, you can't get them to go that fast. The, compared to black holes, they're like big balls of cotton candy. They just, they just kind of come apart. Uh, so if you wanted to detect gravitational waves from you know, more normal stars, you would need a space-based detector or something which can measure much lower frequencies. And even there, you still need fairly compact objects, like white dwarfs or something like that, to produce gravitational waves that are detectable. So well, I can add something to that. I mean, I, I misunderstood your question. I'm sorry. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, there is a project, which, I, which Matt described, which will try to at least look at not planets. That isn't big enough. But binary stars not of the kind that we're looking at, namely ordinary binary stars, stars that have been known for probably at least 100 years. 
and they radiate very slowly. They radiate at periods of four hour, of hours, and that's exactly what a LIGO-like structure in space would be able to detect. And that project's called LISA, L-I-S-A. And we're all hoping that LISA will eventually get flying. And they will look, they will see binary, very slow binary stars, among other things. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry I misunderstood your question. I could add that the other, the other thing, the other sort of source that's not from binary stars are supernovae. Yeah. So if you have a perfectly symmetric supernova, as Ray said, you wouldn't get any gravitational waves. But if you have some asymmetry in a core collapse supernova, you could get gravitational waves from supernovae as well. Uh, they're somewhat weaker. You might think of a core collapse supernova as an enormous explosion. Uh, compared to these black mm -hmm. holes and gravitational waves, they're really not all that strong. Uh, but if we get lucky, we can pick up gravitational waves off, also from supernova explosions. There's a question down there. You've been looking at uh, gravity waves in the space dimension. Are there distortions due to gravity waves in the time dimension as well? And if so, what, what sizes are we talking about? And is it possible to detect that sort of thing? Yeah, well, let, let me take that one. Um, in relativity, space and time are inseparable. What you call space really depends on what's called your frame of reference or your coordinate system. So uh, in most of the analysis, the coordinates are chosen in a way that it's the deformation of space being represented. But you could equally well translate that into a different description in which it was a 10 to the minus 21 distortion of time. In fact, then can I, do you mind if I say something? There's an interesting thing that caused this particular kind of thinking about how to detect gravity, gravitational waves a lot of difficulty in the early days of proposing that you should use light as a way of measuring them. Because people began to think, because they, they thought in two different ways. And, I mean, Ed described them as tidal terms that are flying around. You can describe them also as strains, strains in space. And that's the way many of us think about them. But if you combine the two things together, and which is people did do in the beginning. They didn't stay in a particular coordinate frame. They had ran into a conundrum, which is the following one. I'll leave you the conundrum. The conundrum is, how can you measure gravitational waves if they stretch space? And, and here you're using light wavelengths to do this. Why don't the wavelengths of light stretch also? And consequently, you will see nothing. And that was an argument that went probably quite deep for many, many years as a thing that got in the way of even proposing this. And the trouble was, you can't think both ways. You got to stick in, you either have to stick with a time-like thing or a space-like thing. You can't mix the two for expressing what's going on in these detectors. That's, I mean, I think, I, I didn't say that very well, but you can't sw switch the coordinate systems. Um, on, on, that you're not allowed to do. You're not allowed to mix, co mix coordinate systems. In other words, there's room for theorists in this work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You bailed me out. <laughs> I have two questions. Uh, number one is, how did you know this is what you wanted to do? Uh, You're talking about all of us? Why you get into such a difficult area? Is that the trouble? <laughs> yeah, just the, the general starting of it. Um, and before you do that, the second question, uh, how would you recommend someone who's early in their career uh, arrange their life trajectory such as to have a big impact like this? <laughs> Lisa wants to answer that. No let, let Matt answer. Oh, no, Lisa. You, Lisa. No, Lisa. 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 <laughs> Why did you pick this field? Yeah, um, I have to say, I kind of picked this field. I mean, the, the true, honest answer is that I picked this field because the Virgo Observatory, the interferometry in Italy, is five minutes from my home place. <laughs> <laughs> That's... <Amazing. laughs> That's, that's the, the real answer. Is but, it a necessity uh, with the mother of The invention? reality <laughs> is when I then started working on this, uh, this was so challenging. And then I asked myself, you know, what, what could I do and differently? I mean, what, what other field would be so challenging and so rewarding if we arrive at the end? And so to me, this seemed one of the most difficult I think maybe, maybe this is the most difficult measurement that you can actually do. And the opportunities that this, uh, this measurement open are, are, are incredible. And so I essentially decided to stick to it. 
even if when I started was now 15 years ago. And yeah, my supervisor told me, oh yeah, we're very close to the tech gravitation. <laughs> <laughs> As everyone in this room, essentially, even people who started 30 years ago, right? Uh, but I, I, I decided to stick to it because it was so challenging and so incredible. And the reward was also incredible. Like if you, you know, every time I think about this and actually this incredible, you know, media attention gave us the opportunity of, of thinking about this more deeply. Like we are like measuring the space distortion produced by a black hole. Like, is that, this is incredible. <laughs> this is really incredible. It's much better than Interstellar. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you got an answer, but it's not an easy answer, not an easy question. I mean, everybody has their own motivations. I happen to like to tinker, and this is a wonderful place to tinker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, two very quick questions about the nature of the wave itself. First, I know that you um, compare the wave to a sound wave, and, and I know that a sound wave will travel at different speeds depending on what the medium is, air, water, etc. So my question, my first question would be, how does the gravitational wave and its propagation change, whether it's going through the vacuum of space, going through a planet? And then my second question would be, what might the effects of this gravitational wave, what might it feel like if we were a few orders of magnitude closer, say a million light years instead of a billion? How would yeah, that change things? Good question. Um, yeah, well, the answer to the first one is that the gravity, gravitational waves interact so weakly with matter that they're not significantly affected by matter. Um, you, you maybe have heard of a type of particle called a neutrino that can travel through a light year of lead before being absorbed. Gravitational waves are much less absorptive. They can travel through almost anything, um, any distance. And, and that's because uh, they interact so weakly with matter. You know, there was the previous question about um, whether planets and other systems would exist gravitational waves. Another way of answering it is to say that it's so hard, you have to have so much energy moving so fast because uh, s space is so stiff it takes an enormous amount of mass energy to make the very slightest ripple in space-time, and therefore the, the feedback upon itself is entirely negligible for anything that we can imagine. And sorry, your second question? Yes, if we were, say, a, oh, a million light years away instead of Wait, a billion. Would you feel it? It, it? No, you wouldn't feel it, but it would be a heck of a lot easier to measure. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, uh, Mike and I did a, did a little thought experiment about this, and we, we asked ourselves, what would be the first thing you would notice if you just kept getting closer and closer or turning up the amplitude of your gravitational wave. And eventually we decided that you'd probably hear it. That would probably be the first thing. And it's because, not that the gravitational waves are normally audible, it's really this propagation through space-time is, is different, but, but uh, your, your ears are very sensitive. You can detect a fractional change in the pressure of about 10 to the minus 11 with your ear. And so when the gravitational wave went through your head, it would kind of stretch your head, and also probably, to some degree, compress the air a little bit in your, in your ear canal. So maybe the first thing you would notice would be the, uh, you know, some sound. You might actually hear the chirp without an interferometer and a speaker and all those other things. The next thing you'd probably get is the shock wave from the explosion destroying the Earth, but. <laughs> in that order? In, the in that order, yeah. <laughs> So congratulations again to all of the many facets of this 40-year, uh, 50-year odyssey. Um, there's so many questions, so little time. If I may address the theorist, um, I noticed that in the visualization you have uh, two objects, compact. Um, whether or not they're black or not, you s seem to op leave that door open. Uh, may I ask whether in GR you envision someday getting an exact two-body solution? You have here. A, a very artful numerical pasting together of a one two one-body solutions, the, the Kerr metric or uh, the, uh, the Schwarzschild metric in its various coordinate uh, representations. So uh, do you envision at some future day, time, especially if you consider the interaction of many bodies, not just two, do you envision getting solutions in GR with many bodies? Well, I don't, but I'm not sure that I'm... <laughs> Bold enough. I, I do want to say, though, that uh, rather than thinking about a two-body or a three-body problem, as my colleague Professor Scott Hughes likes to say, 
the binary coalescence problem is a one space-time problem. And the space-time is oscillating and interacting with itself in every imaginable way and many beyond that. Um, this, there are some analogs between the Einstein equations and other what are called nonlinear wave equations. Uh, the, the Clay Institute at Harvard has a million dollar prize for someone who will solve an equation called the Navier-Stokes equation. They should give $10 million for solving the Einstein equations. It's a hard, it's a hard system. I, I could add just a, a commentary about some of the, <laughs> the movies we've been showing. These, these really are numerical solutions to general relativity, and we depend on numerical solutions. So they're not, uh, they're not art. In a sense, it's not an artist's representation. Yeah. Uh, it's only just something that someone drew, but really it is a solution to Einstein's equations done numerically. I mean, let me add something to that, because that's new also. I mean, for, you know, I know what you're, wor you're thinking about, an analytic solution. I mean, Navier Stokes, analytic, or uh, Einstein field equation. But the numerical things have just been solved within your, well, within the last 10 years. For the Pretorius, first right? No, what? Pretorius. Pretorius. Pretorius, thing. Pronounce Pretorius. Well, it's not just him. The whole group of people have been doing this, but he saw a very particular insight that made it possible. I don't see then by putting more mass, my own guess is, putting more masses into it, why that makes it more difficult. I don't, I mean, I, I think that should just propagate. Yeah, it's and, not fundamentally and harder. I, and, and the numerical uh, solutions yeah. are, let me put it this way, when you travel in an airplane, that's been modeled by using numerical simulation. The same now is true of black holes. But these results, your experimental reduction, uh, uh, would not eliminate uh, enhancements, as you said, to the existing theory, and uh, it, they could be quite consistent with alternative descriptions. Well, uh, can I say something? If you look at the paper that, that was published, uh, you'll see an interesting thing. You'll see that the patchwork analytic solutions that have been applied to this problem do very well compared to the numerical solutions. I mean, it just takes a long time to run those numerical solutions. So, for example, when we make our templates that we match against the signals that we're looking at, we are using analytic solutions for most of that because it takes a long time to do all the different cases, cases numerically. But they work very well. I mean, I think the subtleties are, for example, as, as, as Salvo was saying before, to really test the theory, I mean, if you can keep, do better and better by having longer time series. And for, you'll need lighter masses. The one we have, the whole thing is only lasts a quarter of a second. You don't have many cycles. I mean, a lighter set of black holes or a, black, or a, a big black hole with a small thing running into it, something called an emery, are good ways to test the theory because you get then very long time series. And you look and see if the phase evolution of that waveform is correctly predicted by the Einstein equations. That's probably the way the test will go most, yeah. I can add that yeah, for, yeah. for most of our analysis, actually for all of the analysis in the paper we published, we use two different type of, of waveform, you know, independently obtained by different groups in different ways. One is called uh, EOB, the other IMR, that's a bit technical. And uh, both of them are tuned, so they are not fully numerical, but they are tuned against numerical relativity waveforms. And after the event was found, there was a further check where people generate a bunch of numerical waveforms with the masses and spin around the values that we think we recovered. And we just check on that particular section of the parameter space. We kind of zoomed in and check again that our waveform of two different families were consistent with numerical relativity, and, and they were. In that very high degree of. Uh, One other conceptual I, problem. I, think we ought to, yeah, I don't right. want to interrupt. Right, we fine, have other okay. people waiting yeah. here. Thank so. you. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Congratulations for the amount of work you've done. Uh, it's really incredible and it gives a lot of nice energy for everybody. Um, I had a question concerning uh, the beginning and the end, eventual end of a gra gravitational wave. We know that they have a beginning, but do you know if they have an end? And if yes, uh, how would you know that we can hear the waves from the Bing Bang? Oh, end in time. You mean end of each of them or? Like in the history of the universe? Le like. Or beginning, right? Like the one wave has a beginning. Do you know if it has a, an end? If it will no. dissolve at some point in the. Uh, I mean, the. the passes through the Earth. Uh, I, think the, I, I think the question is this. We, we're done with this wave that has caused the chirp. We're waiting for other black holes to do the same thing. Is that what you're asking? 
No, my no. question is that at some point will will a wave dissolve once well, it's the amplitude goes down as okay. one over the luminosity distance. So it will no technically it's, it will continue forever, but this amplitude will go down and down. So we will you know, lose amplitude and energy. Okay, I see it. Thank you. Please. Thanks. Do you think that um, LIGO could detect events that occur in the hidden dimensions of our universe? Oh my God. Possibly relating to dark so energy? <laughs> and then how would you That's prove sad. something like that? <laughs> <laughs> you poor guy, you're going to get that one too. <laughs> um, one thing about gravity is that it crosses dimensions, at least in most of the extra dimensional theories. Um, electromagnetic radiation may not, the, the electric force may not, but um, gravity does, for example, in string theory. So there are, ver, there are theories which predict the existence of extra or hidden dimensions where phenomena arise that we cannot see. What we've learned today is that we may be able to hear them through the gravitational effect of masses in those hidden dimensions. So I think the answer to your question is yes. We could, we could uh, detect phenomena in other dimensions. Now, uh, will we know that we found phenomena in other dimensions? That's a whole other it, right. question. Right, it's hard to prove they came from another dimension, I guess, and not ours, right? Or if, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, one of the hopes of, one of the reasons why we're so happy at MIT to be involved in the LIGO project is that we can combine different uh, technologies and ways of studying the universe. And the hope is that uh, before long, we'll find discoveries with LIGO where we have simultaneous measurements from electromagnetic waves, radio waves, X-rays, and so forth. That will give us information about not maybe the black holes or neutron stars by direct observation, but from their environment and other things that are happening along the way. That will certainly give us clues about what, what is happening in our universe because we will see it as well as hear it. Thanks. Um, so my question was fairly similar. I was going to ask about whether uh, this recent discovery has had any implications for whether string theory is a valid theory. And then I also have a question about when you are correcting for seismic effects on your inferometer. Uh, so it's supposed an, an earthquake were to happen, for example. Uh, how large of an effect would you need to disrupt your um, measuring system? And would you be able to recover from that? I'll take the first one and you can have the second one. <laughs> 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 You're reversing our roles. Huh? <laughs> yeah, now, let's start with the earthquake question because I believe that's happened all the yeah. time, in fact. Yeah, yeah, right. So for the detectors, uh, any sort of large external disturbance, if it's sufficiently large, can disrupt the interferometer. And what I mean by that is we have to hold the, the mirror, mirrors in, in the interferometer just the right place. That means on resonance in our resonant cavities is just the right place. And if they get disturbed by very much, then they move out of resonance and the whole system kind of falls out of control and we have to start over. It takes us a few minutes, could be as long as half an hour, uh, sometimes even longer, to get the thing back up and running again. And that can happen due to any number of things. But any large external disturbance can cause the interferometer to, we call it, say, lose lock. So the control system uh, you know, loses control of the optics, and it takes us a while to get things going again. But this is uh, routine behavior, and it's just part of our duty cycle. It happens all the time. And of course, I should, I should add that the environment around the detectors is monitored in every way we can think of. We have seismometers and magnetometers and radio antenna and everything else. So we're not surprised by these things. When a truck goes by, we know that a truck went by, and the interferometer lost lock because the truck was too big. And, and that, that, that sort of happens. That's just life in interf interferometry. So it's part of our duty cycle and, and not a big problem. String theory? And, and as, far as, as far as testing string theory, string theory is not as complete a theory of, as, as general relativity is. That is, there's no mathematical equations that you can solve and get a result like this. <laughs> precisely to predict what would happen when black holes <laughs> spiral together. Um, the most interesting for me aspect is the question of what happens inside of the black hole. And there are different versions of string theory which make different predictions for inside the black hole. The observations so far aren't able to test those theories, but we all hope that in the future by looking at the precise ring down and the properties of different kinds of black holes merging, there might actually be some ways of seeing how the black hole squishes 
and testing ideas from string theory in that way. Maybe you want to say more about that, Salvo. I agree. I mean, okay. as far as we know, this proves that GR is kind of correct. I don't know if it proves that string theory is wrong, but you know, <laughs> we need more evidence for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. Once again, congratulations for this amazing discovery. Um, I had a question. Get about closer to the mic, please. Yeah. Sure. So the experiment, um, as we saw in the presentation, is from one billion solar years ago. That's the time that it takes for the gravitational waves um, to reach the Earth. I wonder if there is any way, either via experimentation or um, via theory, to predict or to know or to understand what the black hole could be doing right now, this very moment, or predict what the behavior could be or the possibilities of behaviors could be in the future. Thank you. Uh, let me try to, I mean, that really depends on what's going on around it. You know, we, that's where, for example, electromagnetic counterparts, which is what, you know, what Ed was just saying about, is very important. If, for example, we were able to tell somebody with very good precision, and we hope to be able to do that, to tell people who have other detectors, like uh, X-ray detectors, gamma ray detectors, optical detectors, that can say, well, look, take a look over there in that part of the region of the, of the universe. We have discovered a black hole pair there. And we ask, why don't you look and see what's going on around it? That is sort of what you're asking. You can then, you can then predict a little better what you know, might be the life of that black hole. We, we can't do that without just this one event. It doesn't tell, me, doesn't tell us the context in which you find the black hole. I think that's what you're asking. Well, there's, there's yeah. another aspect uh, yeah. of it, which yeah. is that every telescope is a time machine. Mm -hmm. Every telescope looks into the past because we see phenomena whose information has come to us from the past, traveling at the speed of light, even for gravity waves. And I think now we should rename this fundamental constant as the speed of gravity. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've answered your question, but maybe we can. Yeah, OK. Go ahead, please. Hey, thank, thank you so much for answering our questions, and congratulations to everyone. My question is about the relative frequency of these events compared to the other sort of sampling of events on the board here, and the amplitude, uh, the magnitude of these events. Um, and since the scale is so hard to imagine, I want to overburden the analogy of ripples on a lake again. Is this a rock being thrown into a crystal clear lake, or is this a sea of events happening all the time? Well, they're all different classes of sources which people are looking for. For example, even LIGO. Well, we, we, we were thought, thinking when we designed LIGO this time around that we would see neutron star binaries first. And that was the thing that we calculated for. We estimated, if you look at the literature, we made estimates for how many of those we would see. And we were surprised to see black holes first. Now, there are other things. It may very well be that uh, there are sources of, uh, of, of gravitational waves which, for example, are completely CW. They're continuous. I'll give you an example. That's one of the things that first, a lot of people thought about when pulsars got first discovered, uh, people said, well, you know, a pulsar could be a thing that it looks like a wobbling football as it rotates. And that'll radiate gravitational waves. And pe much of the effort of the thousand people who are joining us in this search, that goes into looking for periodic sources like that. There are other people looking just at backgrounds, gravitational wave backgrounds. For example, un un unresolved gravitational wave sources that are out there, and if you start looking and, for example, looking at a noise, a gravitational wave noise, you could see that by cross-correlating two detectors. That's another whole science that's going on simultaneously with this. What, you happen to, what we happen to have found first was a burst, or a, this chirp burst-like thing. But we fully expect there are more of other things which you haven't even thought about. And let me say why we expect other things, and that's something which is sort of more philosophical than scientific in a way. Every time, and this is not new, but every time you open a field, and that's true even in the electromagnetic spectrum, like when X-ray astronomy was first opened, and that was, I lived through that. I, I saw it here at MIT. What happened, people noticed that the universe was really quite violent. You look out, you know, it looks very placid, you know, when you look out at night with your eyes, that nothing seems to be happening. But there's hell going on out there. 
I mean, everything, <laughs> there's explosions, there's all this stuff happening. And I, and I fully expect, and people who've got this into this field fully expect, there's going to be some new kind of things which you haven't thought about because we never had the ability to see them with this new technique. So I can't tell you what they'll be because that, that's the surprise that's in store for us. But it's a, it's, it would be natural that that should happen. Ray, can I add something? What? Can I add something? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah something that since yeah. you mentioned. We're going to get into trouble in a minute. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think we're at time. We're at the time. Uh, okay. We have to give the room back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.